Welcome to this week's Swarf and Chips. We've got a great show lined up for you. This is what's coming up in today's show. However, Paul and I are joined by James Fudge from the MTA. Thank you for joining us, James. Hello, James. Hi. Yeah. Right, James, Mac 2018. As I've said before, it seems like a long distance away being next year, but it's not. It's six months. Well, the last one only seems like yesterday, doesn't it? I know. Yeah. It comes in very, very quickly. Yeah. We were literally <laughs> just talking about that, and you can just, time just flies. So, Emo, we thought the same about Emo, didn't we? Yeah, it was we a long time ago, you know, now it's finished. So, Mac 2018. Still recovering mind, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah. You, you went there as well, didn't you? Because you did, did a press launch, yes. didn't you? Yeah, we, had, um, we were looking at how to promote the, the show to more international uh, visitors. Mm -hmm. So, we had a press launch there on the second day. We had press um, represented from eight different countries. Um, so hopefully it'll give Mac a bit more did, of a, did it work? What is the feel. split of international to So domestic? it's, I mean, predominantly Mac is a UK show visitor-wise. Um, as I say, we're looking to increase that. Um, and certainly with sort of, I hate to mention the B word, but with Brexit on the horizon, you know, this is a real opportunity to come and see the UK. And this is the shop window to look at UK technology. Mm -hmm. And people still keep talking about buying from Great Britain because it's known for that high level of, of advanced manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And do you look at Emo and think, Emo does that very well. Yeah, I mean, for us, you know, Emo is the international show. Um, like I say, because we are more of a UK focus, it was that real opportunity to to come and see the UK PLC sort of piece that sits within that. Yeah. James, you say there's over twenty five thousand visitors. How do you calculate the visitors for the show? Um, so that the way we count ours is pure visitors. So we don't count any exhibitors in that. Anyone that's coming for two days only gets counted once, so they are unique individual visitors walking through the door. It's a nice, accurate do, figures. Are there other shows that do it differently then? Because obviously we're, we're, um, we're Yeah, there's a couple. So sometimes you'll get an attendance figure for an exhibition. So what they'll do within that is they'll talk about the um, exhibitors included within um, and people that are coming for a second day. Um, but we've always done it as individual visitors as a figure. Um, and I don't think there's many other shows in the UK, um, certainly not within this sector, that get that number of visitors. And you look and it says, I saw your latest bulletin, you're 90% sold out of space. We are, yes. So we are, because we're in the new halls, it means that the spaces we've got available are still in really good positions. Um, we've been able to move some of the spaces or some of the um, available stands outside of the zones. So we've got more general space. Um, but we've also opened up a couple of the extra areas. Um, so yeah, there is still space available, but it is, um, we're starting, now Emo's finished. We're starting to see that go quick. So that leads us on to, you know, me asking the question, why should people exhibit at Mac? So for us, it's about putting them in front of 25,000 visitors. So these are people with real purchasing power. They're senior people within the business and people looking to come and buy. I mean, last year we attributed £150 million worth of business. I was going to say, that just came up on the screen and that wasn't a deliberate uh, ploy. <laughs> Timer. I was going to ask that question. £150 million worth of business done over the five-day that, That's event. what people attribute to the show. Right. Um, so for a lot of people, you know, this, this isn't a week show that they go and do every two mm. years. This is about building a pipeline, meeting people. I know someone the other day, they bought a machine because someone saw it at Mac 2012. And this is them now going, right, we've now got to the point where we're ready to purchase. They'll either come back to Mac and do it or they will just contact the company direct. But this really is about a two year cycle, building those contacts up and then talking to them for those next 24 months. And, and if, if you were today talking, let, let's say a lot of uh, today's show is about the exhibitors. Mm -hmm. So uh, trying to sort of tap in and, and show them that they can be part of this uh, show. How do you demonstrate to them about the audience and the 25,000 people? If they ask, is there a way of breaking it down as to how many managing directors there are, how many buyers there are, how does that work? So we do this, I mean, in terms of our um, visitor registration, we keep track of, of who's, who's there and what level they're at. And in our post-show report, which is available on the Mac website, um, it breaks it down into all the different groups. So it'll show which sector people are from, what level they've got, um, and what people are coming to see. You know, are they coming to buy it? Are they coming to look at the latest technology? Um, and certainly with the changes in technology, so things like as data becomes more important, with I4 um, and cyber security, we're starting to see a lot more um, CIOs that are interested in coming along, so the people that look after that information. Um, yep. So I think it will change the dynamic slightly of the visitors this year. James, the MTA, what are they doing to help promote the exhibitors then? Because they're paying for space. They are. What are you doing to kind of back all of that up? So as part of the package... Swarf and chips. Every, well, swarf, <laughs> swarf and chips, Besides of course, me. goes without saying. <laughs> uh, but as part, as, their, as part of their exhibitor package, um, they get a place on our exhibitor training day. So this talks about um, how to exhibit and kind of the basic ethos of, of what you're doing. 
But at that, we also get to educate about the new technologies we're using. So we've got new touch points and badge technology that we're bringing in. Um, and we also offer a lot of marketing support that I think people sometimes forget about as part of their package. Mm. So whether that be email signatures, um, emailers out, invitations to their customers that we can either send on their behalf or we will produce for them to send out. Mm. Because at the end of the day, I'll get 25,500 people through the door. It's for the exhibitors to make sure they visit their stands. Mm. And I would much rather promote the show through exhibitors than just say come to Mac. You know, if we can do it through the exhibitors and promote our exhibitors, then that's the ideal route for us. And kind of play, playing devil's advocate, you, you look at it and you think 25,000 people, that is a phenomenal amount. Is, it, is, is there any other show that, that attracts that amount of people that if you were a potential exhibitor, you could compare Mac to? I mean, <laughs> obviously I'm gonna say no, but actually when you look at other competing shows, there's more specialized shows mm. um, that focus on just sort of small areas that you can see within Mac. But the whole point of Mac is that you can come and see the whole sector, mm. um, whether you're interested in the software, the metrology, or whether it's going for the machinery or even additive. You know, the show's additive manufacturing zone has grown um, purely because we're becoming a trade association known to represent mm. that sector. Um, and also you've got the whole supply chain. So you see a lot of exhibitor to exhibitor business done yeah. because people are in the room with their customers. And, and the layout was always a big thing as well, though, because, again, if, if somebody's watching this and they're thinking, should I exhibit or shouldn't I? Yeah. Maybe two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, they would have gone, well, I'm going to be positioned you know, in the very far corner. Yeah. What's the footfall going to be? That doesn't apply anymore. I mean, that's the thing is we, we knew the flow. We knew how the old halls used to work. Um, and we kind of said, you know, we've been using those halls for 40 years. How do we change that up? Um, and that's why we've obviously kept the NEC, but using a new hall layout, we know that visitor flow is going to be different. And also because visitors are coming along, they're now going, right, how do I find the exhibitors I want to? And they're actually making the effort to look. They're not just heading for a certain part of the show. Um, and if you like, the, the larger exhibitors or those that people are coming to see are now spread out right through the halls. Mm. So you've got a much wider spread. There's there's kind of no bad space within those halls because people are gonna go around no. and explore it all. Change is good, it's not a bad thing. And what I love about shows as well is people are networking from stand to stand as well. So yeah. all the exhibitors, it is, I know it's the same old word, but the networking word does come into it. Now, oh, sorry, Paul. I was just gonna say, what about people these, day that, these days that say, you know, exhibitions aren't what they used to be because people use the internet, they use YouTube. What, 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 what do you guys say about, about that? See, I guess when you look at the power of live events and actually meeting people face to face, I mean, we had a 10% increase last year on visitors. People are still coming to exhibitions. Um, and although there's been a slight downward trend within the industry, Mac has seen that we've, we've kind of bucked that trend and gone against it. So what it. do you think you're doing different that makes that happen? I think people, because our, you know, Mac has live working equipment, and I think people want to come along and it means they've got this huge exhibition. They can come along and see lots of different companies with working live demonstrating mm. machinery. You know, and that's the thing. This is all, it's all under power. Those machines are live cutting or live 3D printing. And it's just, it's, I think it's that buzz and you don't get that from other shows. I've got to say, I'm all for events, and I think you know it costs the company to come out and visit a show. It's free food and drink so, for you. Isn't it? Well, this <laughs> food, yeah, free food and drink, yes, for. <laughs> but you know, it costs them one to come out to an event at the end of the day, mm -hmm. and you know, it, per hour they're probably seeing that, and they're going through, you know big suppliers, they're seeing these machines, I'm all for an event, and you cannot be that conversation that you have with a CEO, with an engineer next to that machine. Now, James, I think you're coming back soon, hopefully, and we're gonna be discussing some more, more the visitor side of yes. Mac. So, yeah. thank you for joining us today, James. No, thank thanks. you for joining us, and now over to Cycle Time Challenge. Cycle Time Challenge. Phil, really interesting component here, aluminium. Uh, turning, boring, tapping, uh, milling, uh, live tooling. Um, there's a feature here, specialised link feature at the back here. Can you tell me a little bit about this component, please, Phil? Yeah, this is a component that uh, was previously made in-house by our customer. Um, the feature on the end that you can see where it's milled is critical to the function of the part. Um, prior to getting our multi-axis fixed head machines, we couldn't make this. Um, far too intricate, it would have took us too long with all the cross drilling and tapping that's involved. Um, with the, the milling being critical, uh, the customer did send engineers over to us because they were concerned as to whether we could make it. Uh, after a couple of weeks, 
they came back to us and said, uh, we're not going to make these anymore. You're going to make them because you're making far better than we do, uh, which was uh, very pleasing to hear. So there you have it. Fixed head lathe, live tooling, turning, milling, tapping, boring. How long? We're at Precision Aircraft Surface Treatment. They've got a load of different processes. Now, one of their sections is the NDT, non-destructive testing. And within that section, there's a number of different processes that you can do. What's the first one? Acid etch. Um, with acid etch, we have to um, give it a vapor blast. Um, the vapor blast consists of water and um, blasting media. Um, it gives it a uniform finish and activates the um, components. And then what next? Uh, from there, it uh, goes into our acid etch tank that's um, full of uh, nitric acid solution. Okay. Um, you put it in there for the allotted amount of time for the spec, take it out, give it a rinse, then straight into the dewatering oil. And then once that, is this the finished part here? It is, yes. Um, and from here in the inspection area, we would um, test to see, and you can see that um, the light area shows that it's got some, um, it's been hardened from uh, grinding abuse or machine abuse. Right, so really obvious is the, the damage here. So like you say, the tooling might have broken or working the machine a bit too hard? Yes, correct, yes. Okay, that's a great example in terms of your acid etching. What's the next process you do? Uh, penetrant floor detection. Let's go and have a look. So a second process, and this one highlights sort of cracks and defects in objects. Yes, this is uh, penetrant floor detection. Uh, with this, we would put it into a fluorescent solution. Um, we would wash it off then put it into an emulsifier, wash that off, put it come back to um, another wash off area. Uh, from there, we put it into um, a drying oven. Uh, from the drying oven, we'll then put it into the developer. Um, with all that, the fluorescence would stay into the cracks or the defects to show up any um, informalities into the product. Right, now show my age here, it's pretty much like developing a, a film. Yes, correct, yes. And then, so any cracks, defects, under the UV light, it will highlight those cracks and defects. Yes. Sounds simple. <laughs> yes, it is, but um, very important for the um, components. Okay. And third process in NDT? Would be magnetic floor detection. Seems like an opportune time to go and have a look. No, third process in NDT. Yep, that would be uh, magnetic floor detection. Uh, with this, we uh, get components and put it on a mag bench. Um, with this, electric current passes through the components. Um, it magnetizes the components and draws the fluorescent uh, solution to any cracks or defects in the components. So you've got that magne magnetic solution in the component. How, does it, how do you actually identify the cracks? Um, what we do, well, we give it a um, UV light shine on it and if there's a, a line and finds a crack or a hole, um, you can see the um, fluorescent solution in those holes or cracks. Again, really obvious like the other two procedures. It's, you do all this fantastic job here, but surely there's sort of a sign-off accreditation is required? Yep, um, we can sign off to level three, um, which gives it a full approval of each component. Okay, and level three is a top approval level? It is, yes. Okay, and aerospace? Aerospace as well, and um, it's NADCAP approved. Okay, so quick summary then of the NDT, the three different processes? Yep, it's uh, acid etch inspection, a penetrant floor detection, and magnetic floor detection. Excellent, so anybody who needs to test components for any sort of damage, get in contact with you guys. Correct. Deal of the week. MTD CNC are at Axon Status this morning. Gio and myself have got a special offer we're going to tell you about. This is a Tuscan lathe, CNC lathe. This is, the, the model is an LC34 4000 machine. Gio, before we actually unfold on the on the detail and stuff tell us what the special offer price is that you've got in your hand there the price for this machine and it's a it's a beast of a machine is 165,000 pounds so that's 165,000 pounds delivered right now let's tell you about it before we go into the spec what do you like about looking at this machine because you've had 20 minutes to sort of walk around and get a feel for it you've used machines like this before what's good about it well, the first thing that strikes me about this machine is, Paul, is, 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 is the actual physical size of the machine. It's, a, it's an absolute beast of a machine. But not only the size of the machine, with all of the attachments that actually come along with this machine. It's got some really nice features. I really like the swarf evacuation. You've got 
different size steady rest, uh, the manual steady rest that come with the machine, a very large boring attachment, 32 inch independent scroll chuck, um, adjustable programmable tail stop. And, 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 and often with these machines, some of these, these items don't come as standard, but this deal, the price that we mentioned does actually include all of these items. You just said about a programmable tail stop. It's a movable tail stop, but I don't think you can you actually program that. I think the, the, the quill may be programmable. I'm not sure. We'd need to double check or you'd need to check before you purchased it. But you mentioned as well the Swarf evacuation. This has got a, a Swarf conveyor both sides. It's got one at the front and the back, hasn't it? And did you note from the middle of the machine how, how the swarf falls? Yeah, if, if you look inside of the casting in the centre of the machine, you see that the casting tapers away towards the rear of the machine. So this, the gravity of the swarf just lets it flow into the back conveyor. Um, and then any overflow swarf, you've got a conveyor at the front as well. So it's quite very nice design, because obviously with a machine of this nature, there's going to be a lot of uh, swarf coming off, you'd, you'd think. But the bins are quite small at the back, aren't they? You noted that, but I suppose it's going to be going quite slowly, isn't it, with all, all the conveyors are? Yeah, I think the actual machine itself, within the body of the machine and the sump of the machine, is going to be able to accommodate for quite a lot of swarf. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, the actual spindle on this is 37 kilowatts. It's got a 230 mil bore as well would you believe so you can bury up to 230 millimeters and the swing is 870 mil now what do you know about this um this tool post i'm not very familiar with this tool post i think you've got four different positions um and you can uh, effectively i think paul when you're turning components of this size you, it, it's not about speed and, and changing your tools because one tool is going to be um, turning the part for a long period of time. So you don't need lots of tool stations. So it does, does what it says on the tin and, and for its application. And it's 250 mil, but there is an option with this machine as well where you can go for a, you can go for a bigger tool post. But it does actually have the VDI tool in, which is quick change as well. And as Gio mentioned, it's got two fixed steadies on this machine, but it does come with a, a travelling steady as well in the actual special offer. I think another point that I picked up on is a lot of these types of lathes aren't necessarily fully enclosed but this is both all of these doors closed so you you've got that enclosure there for any coolant or swarf obviously you just want the swarf and the coolant to come out of the, the conveyors. Uh, we spoke about the the tail stop it is powered and so is the quill. What we didn't talk about was the control. Have you got any familiarity with the FANUC system at all? I've used FANUC in the past on milling machines, not on a lathe. Um, yeah, standard FANUC uh, programming and it, and language. It, and, it, and it comes with, it actually comes with a uh, manual guide for turning as well. It's a 16 tonne machine, 16 tonnes, and it's a one piece casting as well. So all of that 16 tonnes is, is, is not bolted together by three or four different pieces, it's one piece. Where is someone going to, or why is someone going to buy one of these and what they get a machine on it? I think predominantly I would say it's got to be oil and gas industry but um, you've got lots of industries now, the nuclear industry, the power generation industry, there's some very large components out there so you never know, it's not just the oil and gas industry, large components obviously, large turn components, no milling features on there really. So large turns component. And that boring bar as well that you can see at the back of the machine, that is actually included in this special offer. Not only just the machine, the backup and support that you'd expect from a machine tool supplier in the UK comes with 24 months warranty uh, and obviously all the tools and, uh, and uh, equipment we suggested. And just remind us, Gio, what's the price? I mean, it's unbelievable value, £165,000. I mean, just all the attachments alone, if you add them up, it's unbelievable value. So you can see this machine on Axon Status's website or you can also see this offer on MTD. Thank you for watching this week's Wolf and Chips. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and have a go at our Cycle Time Challenge and put your guess in the comments box below. Now if you want to watch any previous episodes, click on the links here. And as we always say, keep those spindles turning. Happy Halloween! Happy